This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So this is episode 97. And a pretty cool guest this week with Greg Zuckerman joining us. Yeah, he was something to talk to. He's a journalist with the Wall Street Journal, but he writes about, well, I think on his bio on Wall Street Journal website, it says that he writes about big trades and big traders, big, big fund managers. So he's most recently written a book about Jim Simons and Renaissance Technologies, which is, if you don't know the story. Well, we talked about it a few weeks ago. Right. On the podcast. I know a book, bunch of, of course, listeners yeah. did listen and took that suggestion to read the book. Yeah. So well, what a guy. I mean, he has a fascination with the characters of Wall Street. We wrote about John Paulson, too, who's the guy that made a ton of money on the U.S. housing crash or the debt crisis that the U.S. housing market had. He's also written about Carl Icahn that we talked about a few weeks ago in the Herbalife story. So he knows a lot of these characters and has done hundreds of interviews with Wall Street characters. And this latest book is absolutely fascinating. But talking to Greg about his views on investing and his views on the market and market efficiency, given his direct experience with the people who are effectively trying to prove that the market is inefficient, Greg's insight was fascinating. I loved his answers to the questions we asked him about. Especially when you look at the Renaissance Technologies Fund is arguably the best performing investment ever at 66% per year for 30 years pre-fee. It's 39% after fee, but still it's unbelievable performance. So we had a chance to really dig into that company and that's what the most recent book is about. So he's a three-time winner of the Gerald Loeb Award, which is the highest honor in business journalism. He's been with the Wall Street Journal for 23 years as a special writer and often on CNBC, Fox Business, Yahoo Finance, Bloomberg, NPR, BBC. So he sees a ton of media exposure. Yeah, I think his insights on what the big name fund managers mean for market efficiency and how average investors should take what those type of people say and do in terms of what it means for their own investments. I think his insight on that was really fascinating. And also how these people had rules which kind of the right rule at the right time in the right place, but hard to replicate afterwards. So there may have been market conditions. And that's what we talked about with John Paulson's big trade in the crisis. For Paulson, it sounded like it came down to size, fund size, where he had the systems, he made the right trade, but then afterwards, it's the active managers sowing the seeds of their own destruction argument, where as soon as you have these great returns, money starts flowing in. And from an economic perspective, the manager doesn't want to turn the money away. So they end up destroying their own ability to have good performance. And that's one of the things that we talked about in the discussion with Greg is that Renaissance Technologies has not done that. They've capped the size of the fund and that's one of the reasons they've been so successful. In fact, they flush out the gains every year to keep the size fixed. Anyways, with that, anything else to add? No, I mean, we talked a lot about Renaissance Technologies, but we also talked a lot about Greg's views in the market in general. I think it was a really good discussion. So enjoy our interview with Greg Zuckerman. Greg Zuckerman, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Great to be here. We're so happy to have you join us and get a chance to introduce you to our listeners. You've written about big name fund managers like Jim Simons, John Paulson, Steve Cohen, George Soros, and Carl Icahn, to name a few. Has the experience of covering these stories affected your own personal investment philosophy? It has. I am restricted here at the Wall Street Journal in terms of what I can buy and sell. So we generally just stick to kind of mutual funds, that kind of thing, and index funds. But in terms of my philosophy, my understanding of markets and how they operate, I believe that markets have become more efficient and they're not entirely efficient. The reason why I get paid a salary is to find those who can locate inefficiencies. And there are some of those that exist. But over time, of recovering markets and individuals and firms for 23 years at the Wall Street Journal, I do have an appreciation for how efficient the market has become, how much more challenging it is to outperform and to create this alpha. So on the one hand, I do find the markets have become more efficient. I also find that the ideas that emanate from Wall Street, so from the best minds on Wall Street, are just not what they used to be. So I used to go to these meetings with billionaire type hedge fund managers and walk away just impressed on uh, their understanding of the markets, their unique ideas, things I hadn't heard before, different approaches to trading and such. And it does happen still, but with less regularity. So I sometimes will come away saying, I can't believe these people charge two and 20. And not just the returns, but even just the ideas they come up with. So it's Part of the reason why I wrote this last book, The Man Who Solved the Market, because here was at least somebody or a group of people that were able to justify the fees. But part of it is just getting older and more cynical and jaded. But yeah, I find 
it's hard to justify the fees, increasingly hard when it comes to Wall Street and the financial industry's best and brightest. It's interesting. So you covering these sort of super investors has resulted in you believing that the market is, at least for the purposes of the average investor, efficient enough that you should probably just invest in diversified low cost stuff as opposed to trying to identify great managers. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah. I mean, it's possible. And it's also possible to find niches out there. And I wouldn't necessarily tell the individual investor not to invest in the market or the professional in a fundamental way. They've got to have some competitive advantage and it's just hard to find. But hypothetically, you could be some, you know, doctor with a specialty and you focus on that kind of investing. You know the company's better than others. Or you could be some kind of narrow type fund manager with that expertise. And I do think there are still possibilities to outperform. It's just harder than it used to be. And it just always was kind of hard. And from writing about these individuals, I do find that as bright and smart and as competent as they are, they get it right, you know, barely more than 50% of the time. And even you mentioned this individual, John Paulson, who I wrote a book about, it's called The Greatest Trade Ever. And I give him a lot of credit for making $20 billion over two years, anticipating the financial meltdown. And he and his colleagues p- pulled off what it was the greatest trade ever, but he's underperformed ever since. And I don't think it's because the greatest trade ever was some fluke of luck in any way. But I do think that there are temptations and distractions and tendencies that even the best investors succumb to. In this case, John Paulson got too big. And he started trading and investing in a way he hadn't before this trade. So you get away from what brought you there kind of thing. And that to me was at the heart of the mistake and his underperformance. Not that, oh, well, it was a one-hand wonder and he got lucky and geez, you shouldn't never give him that much credit for the original home run. No, it's that he no longer invests in that kind of way. I can elaborate and give you more details, but that's kind of my sense of things. Yeah, if you could elaborate, that would be great. Maybe if you can talk a little bit about Paulson's trade and how he was able to pull it off and then elaborate a little bit more on why he has not continued to outperform since. Sure. So John Paulson and his colleagues are among the few who got it right, got 2008 right, anticipated the mortgage meltdown. But not only that, they get it right. They figured out a way to express their trade. And that to me is much more impressive. There are a lot of people who are bearish about housing. And I wrote about them, I talked to them, but 99% of them couldn't figure out a way to make a lot of money from the meltdown. They either were too early or invested in the wrong things. Let's say they shorted housing-related stocks, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, that kind of thing. So what Paulson and Pellegrini and these others at his firm did was figure out the perfect trade, and that was buying these CDS contracts, which is just like insurance. They bought insurance on toxic mortgage product and there was limited downside as a result. And frankly, that was his approach to investing historically. So he's a merger arm. That sort of underlines the irony or the paradox of this whole thing. And a merger arm got the mortgage meltdown, the housing crisis right. It wasn't a mortgage expert. It wasn't a housing expert. But it was somebody who historically had always had a strategy. His tactic was to buy investments with a limited downside and huge potential upsides. When he was a merger or basically betting on merger stocks, he would get into situations where he would buy shares of companies that were already subject to a takeover offer. So in other words, these takeover offers usually go through, so his downside was limited. Worst comes to worst, most likely the company would be acquired. And his upside was huge because he would buy those that had a possibility of some third party coming in and making a counter offer, a new offer, a big offer. And that was an interesting, nice way of of investing. And it resulted in profits for him and his firm. And that's exactly what he did with the greatest trade ever. I call it the greatest trade ever, partly because of how much money they made, but also partly because, again, it it was a beautiful trade in that it had limited downside. They they were buying CDS contracts. And the downside was the cost of the contracts. And it was like 7 8% a year. And frankly, that was too much for a lot of investors I talked to on Wall Street. Well, yeah, Greg, I think there's a huge, tremendous upside, but I can't be paying out money. I can't have a downside where I'm losing 7 8% a year. And that's sort of how Wall Street views these things. They don't want to have negative carry, as they call it, where you're paying out. I don't want to be paying out. And John Paulson was like, wait, downside is like 7 8%, but the upside's 3 400 or more percent. Why wouldn't I do that trade? And he backed up the truck and did that. And that's why it's a beautiful trade. So in other words, once again, limited downside and huge potential upside. And that's a nice way to invest. 
But after he made all this money, $20 billion, and you know, was lauded by me, but by others as well, and became the preeminent hedge fund manager, managing like $35 billion, A, he got too big, and B, he got away from what brought him there. He became an investor like anybody else, sort of a more macro kind of investor. He was betting on gold, betting on silver, betting on pharmaceutical stocks, bank stocks. With all that stuff, you know, there's upside and downside. It's not, not that same strategy of limiting your downside and having unlimited upside. And I guess the larger point is that I see often, frankly, successful investors who get away from what made them so successful. Sometimes they get too big. Sometimes they, like with Paulson, they adopt a different strategy. So once again, I don't believe Paulson was lucky with the greatest trade ever in any way. He made a brilliant trade. We can all learn from it. But the lesson also is to continue to do what got you there as opposed to getting a little bit, maybe it's hubris, maybe it's overconfidence. People throw money at you. You accept the money. You get too big. You have to embrace your second and third and fourth best ideas instead of just your best ideas. So fascinating. So let's go from the greatest trade ever to arguably the greatest investor ever which is Jim Simons of the Renaissance Technologies Medallion Fund, subject to your most recent and fabulous book. Thank you. So Ben and I both loved the book. Can you describe what made that fund so successful? Yes. Yeah, so they are the greatest money-making firm in the history of modern finance. I use that word intentionally because I don't know if you call them investors. You know, They're short-term traders. They're not high frequency, but they're pretty short-term. And they're not traders either. You think of that as more like a Wall Street functions and trader at a Wall Street firm. I call it just call money maker. But yes, yeah, sixty six percent a year since nineteen eighty eight. He's worth twenty three billion dollars. This guy Jim Simons, and the question is, what's the secret sauce? And it's hard to summarize succinctly. I'll give you a bunch of things they do differently or better than everybody else. Part of what they do is they don't anticipate where markets are going or where individual investments are going. They look for relationships. This is specifically on the equity side. So it's relationships among stocks, a group of stocks versus another group of stocks, a group of stocks versus a factor, model, an index, that kind of thing. And that's just a different kind of way of investing. And they've capped their funds at $10 billion. This is called the Medallion Fund. It's their key funds. That's helped them. So again, as opposed to John Paulson, who let his fund get up to like 35 $36 billion, the medallion renaissance has kept the medallion funds lower to $10 billion. And they hire differently than everybody else. They hire mathematicians and scientists. They look for repeating patterns. You can look at them as technical analysts to some extent, much, much more sophisticated version of that. They manage people much differently. I consider my book as much a management book as a trading and investing book. They have a series of advantages over everybody else. And then that just kind of creates a steady stream of profits. It's not crazy amount of gains, but yeah, steady stream of profits, which they in turn leverage up. And because it's so steady and because they've got good relationships with Wall Street and because they trade so much, they can get really good pricing on their leverage. So that's a key part of it too. They leverage up. You know, to summarize, that's kind of what they do better than everybody else. I wrote a long book which talks about a lot of the advantages, but those are some of them. How important do you figure capping the size of the fund has been to their continued success? I think it's huge. And it wasn't an easy decision. They had to kick out loyal investors and basically they only kept them their own money and the money. A little bit of family and some friends. Most of the friends eventually got cut out though. You know, some people will make the argument about my book. Well, Greg, you write about a fund that's $10 billion in size and you compare their performance to Buffett and Dalio and all these others who manage hundreds of billions of dollars. And I would counter by saying no one forced Warren Buffett <laughs> to let Berkshire Hathaway get so big or Ray Dalio or AQR. These firms and individuals could have capped their fund like Jim Simons did at $10 billion. Now, Simons does leverage it up, as I said, so it gets sometimes 10 times leverage and that gets you $100 billion. But still, that's smaller than some of these other big firms we're talking about. So yeah, I do think by limiting your size, you can focus on markets where you find performance and others who embrace the bigger AUM, bigger asset under management, that strategy, they have to settle when it comes to certain markets and certain trades and not their best ideas, et cetera. So yeah, I think it's hugely important. Talk to us about who Jim Simons is. I mean, he was a preeminent mathematician long before the fund was founded. Yeah, it's kind of my contention that even if he had never 
traded or invested at all, he'd still be worthy of a book. As you said, he's a groundbreaking mathematician. He grew up in suburban Massachusetts, or actually Newton, not too far out from the city itself, and was very adept at math and skilled. And it was his passion. And he did MIT in three years, got a PhD at Berkeley, taught at MIT and at Harvard, and then he left to break code for the government during the Cold War. And it's just a fascinating period of time. He learned about algorithms. He learned how to create a secretive environment where people they don't speak about what they do, what they're working on to anybody on the outside. And also it's a very collegial environment as well. The mathematicians were all working together in, in an interesting way. And yeah, they go down in history as doing some really interesting work for the government. I talk about that a little bit in the book, but I found it sort of fascinating. I learned about that world. And then he went on to run SUNY, Stony Brook's math, math department and really turned that thing around, made it into a world-class department. And there he learned during that tenure, he learned how to recruit and how to hire, how to lure people, how to woo them, how to convince people that weren't so interested in joining Stony Brook. It wasn't a well-respected department at the time. Somehow he got them to leave Ivy League schools to do so. And that those were other skills he developed. And he also did some math, some work that goes down in history. He's really among the most important geometers of the past 1,500 years. Some of his work is still relevant in math, but also in areas of physics. So yeah, he's a really interesting guy. He's also interesting just because he does the math and he's a quant, but he also is somebody who is interested in people. He's outgoing, he drinks, he smokes like a chimney. And He's unique in that regard because most people could do one or the other. They're the people, I'm a people person kind of thing or a mathematician. You know, the joke about mathematicians is an outgoing mathematician is one who stares at your shoes as opposed to his or her own shoes. But uh, Jim Simons is not like that. So I found him quite fascinating as a character. I think it's easy to jump to the conclusion that Simon's brilliance in mathematics is what has allowed the medallion fund to be so successful. But in reading the book, I don't know if that's necessarily true. What role do you think Simon's played in the outcome that that fund has gotten? Yeah. So some people have read the book, criticized my portrayal in that as a neurotic writer, we're much more focused on the criticisms than on the uh, compliments. So one of the criticisms is, well, Greg, the book's called The Man Who Solved the Market, but it wasn't Simon's who really came up with the signals, as we call them, these breakthroughs, the developed trades and the algorithms that really led to all the profits. The breakthrough was in 1996, where a couple of computer programmers and scientists from IBM came over and developed an equity trading approach that works. So there's just so much you can give Simon's credit for is the argument. And I would counter that by saying that Steve Jobs was in the factory coming up with the uh, prototypes. He developed the architecture, the system that enables the breakthroughs. And that's exactly the case with Jim Simons. He understands the math and works with those and asks really good questions. They, they give him a lot of credit, but his genius is managing genius is the way it was described to me by somebody who spent a lot of time there. And I understood that. And then frankly, as a writer, I was a tad disappointed. I was hoping Jim Simons, I've developed some scenes where he was responsible for the breakthroughs. And the scenes in the book is those who've read it and those who will. It's a bunch of mathematicians and scientists, characters, quirky, odd, unusual, colorful individuals. But Simons is usually not the one responsible. And yet, people internally and people who've left don't in any way resent the fact that he makes about a billion dollars a year for hardly going into the office nowadays because he made some really key important decisions along the way, when to pull back the system, when to not rely on models. Everything's about computer models, and they still do. 99% of the time, they let things, they press the button and they let the trades go where they will and the model go where it will. But there's that 1% of the time when Simon says, no, I don't trust the model here. We're going to override it. And people eternally give him a lot of credit for keeping the firm alive and going in those rare instances. So Simon's, I do think, should get an enormous amount of credit, but you know, his colleagues too. That's why I focused on them as well. One of the things that I found striking in the book was that 1% of the decisions that Simon's made based on intuition. And that's mind-blowing to me because it's all about the algorithmic trading and that's what's made them so successful in the long term. But how much of a role do you think luck on Simon's intuition played in their ultimate outcome? It's a good question. So in some ways, I regret how many scenes I have where Simon's is pulling the plug or telling them to override the system, et cetera. Just in that 99% of the time, that's not what happens over there. And especially after he's, he's 81 now and he's not running his day to day, today, they rarely ever override the system. But as you say, some important times they did. 
And I won't call it luck, but you need good luck. You need good fortune. Listen, a lot of what I do for a living in my books and at the Wall Street Journal as well, I write about the winners and the self-selecting group for everyone who wins or everybody like Jim Simons and his colleagues who make history. There's maybe 10 other people who maybe had the same kind of approach and didn't have the same luck. So you need good fortune, I'd call it, as much as skill. And in life, you know, it's one thing I've learned as I get up there, at least 50% of success in life is good fortune and counting your lucky stars or thanking some being, whoever you are, however you deal with that kind of stuff. You need health. Uh, and that's part of the good fortune. There's just so much you can do. It increase your, your chances, but you need a lot of the good fortune too. So yeah. So in 1996, they turned the corner, they figured out equity trading, but they spent years struggling when it came to equities. And had they not figured out how to make money in stocks, they would go down as a successful hedge fund. They made good money and bond futures and commodities and currencies, but they wouldn't be the greatest of all time in any way. So he gave his colleagues, he gave the, gave the people running the equity side of things six months. And he was he gave them a long leash. He was really patient. It helped. Remember we talked about earlier how he kicked out his outside investors? That helps. He has a structural advantage in that regard because most others probably wouldn't have given them years to get this thing right. But even Jim Simons was coming to the end of the rope giving them no more rope left to his colleagues. And had he pulled the plug, you know, again, history would have treated them differently, but he gave them another six months and they figured it out. And even how they figured it out from the book, those who've read it, you guys read it, there was some luck there as well, because this guy, David Magerman, who was close to being fired and really unpopular within the firm and a series of screw ups, monumental screw ups, letting a virus free within the firm. It's crazy. He's the one who said, mistake here, guys, in the programming where a number wasn't being updated. It was static. And he brought it to his bosses. And instead of just saying, get lost, they could have done that. And David, we're about to fire you. I don't know why we're going to take any advice from you. They said, that, hey, let's look into this. And he was right. And he figured out the glitch. So there's good luck there too. Had Magerman not stayed up late trying to turn his reputation around, maybe they wouldn't have found it. Or maybe they would have found it, but it would have been too late kind of thing. Probably eventually would have realized they had this number that didn't screw up. So yeah, there's some important lessons there about life too. Unbelievable. I mean, those anecdotes are great. But even pre-Medallion, when Simons was just starting to trade and before they had any of the models, or at least not the robust models that they have now, Simons was just making bets and he was winning or he won enough to keep himself going. And I just thought that was unbelievable to look at what we can observe now as the ultimate outcome and to recognize that Simon had early on just some pure, pure luck. Well, I wouldn't call pure luck. He was a good trader using intuition. But your point is a good one that he is the preeminent quant. He is the role model for everyone. And just so your listeners are aware, quant trading is about 31% of all trading today. So everyone's going in that direction. And right, here he was the role model. And for years, for 12 years, from 1978 to 1990, he kind of went back and forth on how he should be trading. Should I be using a mathematical model? Should he be winging it, using intuition and judgment? I mean, they had this red phone they set up at one point that rang whenever there was big market news and they were going to try to trade before everybody else. And you know, it was kind of preposterous. The, the phone would ring. They couldn't find him sometimes. Simons was in the bathroom. The secretary would come and hey, Jim, you got to come out. Weed's down 10%. So not the most sophisticated approach to investing and not quantitative in any shape or form. And right, he did make a lot of money that way, but he gave back some of it. And it just was hard on him emotionally, the ups and downs, as I'm sure people can relate to. It's, it's hard. Not everyone can handle it. I mean, personally, I always loved investing and trading and was going to go into it. And I don't have that temperament where I can handle the ups and downs. And not everyone does. And Jim couldn't. And that's why, in part, why he developed mathematical models to trade autonomously and so that he removed the intuition and judgment from the situation. I'm going to have to say, he's kind of proud at how well he did using his instincts. He made money with gold and silver, but it was hard on him. And it wasn't clear he could reproduce this and keep it going. So probably wouldn't have been able to. What was your biggest surprise in pulling together this story? There were a lot of them. Partly it was the fact that it took so much tenacity and perseverance because you look at those returns off 66% since 1988 and you figure, okay, this guy kind of figured it out and his characters, his individuals, and the rest is history. But there were so many twists and turns. And as we said, 
serendipity, good fortune that was important, smart decisions along the way. It could have gone in a different direction. Also, the personalities. I mean, I was a little naive coming into this in that I'm not a math person. I don't know mathematicians, really. And naively, maybe I kind of viewed them as focused on being rational individuals, focused on numbers. And you see they're as emotional and competitive and full of jealousies and the real full behavior characters that, that I hadn't expected and I appreciated. So I was relieved about that. You mentioned survivorship earlier in our conversation and you write about the winners. And there's the famous quote from Fisher Black that the market appears a lot more efficient on the banks of the Charles than it does on the banks of the Hudson, referring yeah. to academia versus in practice. <laughs> so yeah. being where you are, and you mentioned this earlier, you mentioned market efficiency earlier, but being where you are and seeing these winners, but also clearly being aware of the data in aggregate, how do you think about market efficiency in general? So yeah, listen, I give a lecture at my alma mater, Brandeis University, not too far from the Charles near Boston. And I remember it really struck me that when I went to school, it wasn't even questioned. The official market hypothesis wasn't even a hypothesis. I put it in a paper. I remember and here I came from growing up, I was trading and investing and believe there were some inefficiencies and you couldn't even suggest as much in a paper back in those days. And I'm not sure today about the world of academia, but yeah, that is the view of many in academia that the markets are efficient. And frankly, I'm not saying I've come back to that view. As I said earlier, I think markets become more efficient. It's not fully efficient. But yeah, I mean, even talking to the Renaissance people, I just heard a, a speech by the CEO last week, and he thinks that markets are much more efficient than they used to be. It's just hard to digest information. It's coming fast and furious and faster than it used to be. So on the one hand, markets are more efficient. On the other hand, we're looking at markets that are literally up and down thousands of points a day in different directions and based on news, but not so convincing news that it would justify as much. So how does the track record of the Medallion Fund fit into some sort of framework of an efficient market? They are among the few who are able to find those remaining inefficiencies. And the question is, can they continue to do so as the inefficiencies shrink? Listen, there are inefficiencies. People like Jim Simons and his colleagues will continue to find them. The question is, are there enough out there for everybody or for all the investment firms out there? And you could argue that maybe they help make the market more efficient, potentially, in their fast trading and allocating capital where it should. They would probably pat themselves on the back and suggest as much. I'm not sure. If we think about the average investor who sees these super investors that you write about, as they're kind of like celebrities in some circles anyway. Medallion Fund and Jim Simons and Renaissance, probably less so because they're so private, but you think about people like Buffett and Dalio who are pretty public with their opinions and views. How much weight do you think the average investor should give to the things that Dalio and Buffett say? Like if Buffett's holding cash, should investors hold cash? And if Dalio says, get into gold, should investors get into gold? Ah, that's a good question. So I think you can learn lessons from smart individuals in every walk of life. I try to. As part of this project, one of the privileges is I get to go out to Princeton University and talk to an 80-year-old mathematician who knew Jim Simons back in the day, and we talk about life. And you can learn lessons, especially the area of expertise. So Buffett is worth listening to, for sure. And so is Munger. <laughs> and they've got both investing lessons and life lessons, and um, they're brilliant, and you can all learn from that. But that said, you know, Warren Buffett has underperformed the market for about 15 years. So you want to take everything with a grain of salt. I mean, Ray Dalio has this book out, Principles. I have it. I haven't read it yet. But I've heard many of those principles are contradictory. So they are convincing and intelligent. And then you read another one and you say, wait, hold on a second. Don't they oppose each other? Aren't they in contradiction with each other? And the second one is equally kind of brilliant and such. So I guess my point again is that I think you don't want to do what they do necessarily, but you can learn from them. There are important lessons. You just want to take everything with a grain of salt. And I guess what I took away from my experience, from the Renaissance experience, is the importance of having a system, having a set of rules. And that's true if you're an investor, but that's true 
in life, I think. So again, they are a systematic investor. They have a group of rules and systems and they defer to them and they don't use gut, intuition, judgment. One thing we've learned is that we humans are susceptible to all the behavioral mistakes, greed, fear, panic, just dumb stuff that we do time and time again. You want to fight that as much as possible. So I'm not saying that everybody has to be a quant. Not everybody can and not everybody should, but we should have a set of rules. And it's true in any walk of life. You look at like surgeons, you look at pilots, they have these checklists over the last few years that even though a veteran pilot's like, I've done this a million times, I don't need no checklist. Yeah, they've learned in surgeons too that just forcing them to do these checks, yes, I've done this, yes, I've done that before you take off, that kind of thing has been really helpful. And yet, you look in the White House, you look at areas of politics, and people are still sort of winging it, ignoring data, proud of their gut intuition, and it scares me as a citizen, frankly. So again, I'm not saying everybody needs to be a quant, but try to establish a set of rules and a system that can be calming for you and reassuring, and you can rely on, especially markets like we're going through today. That's interesting. Do you think that applies in general? It's kind of like what you said with my question about Buffett and Dalio, not necessarily do what they do, but take lessons from yeah. how they behave. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. Yeah, we're not going to be as smart as they are, but we can take some lessons from what they do. When you think about your experience with Renaissance and Jim Simons, algorithmic thinking is a big one. And I think I read an article that you wrote about some lessons to take away. That was one of them. Were there any other big learnings for you? How you don't want to go up against these guys. They're just too successful, too good. Huh. I mean, people don't really appreciate the type of talent they have there. They've got scientists and mathematicians who are groundbreaking in various fields, in physics and different areas of science and different areas of math, astronomy, etc. So these people are not just PhDs, they just led departments and have groundbreaking stuff. So you don't want to be a trader or investor that's going up against them. And how do you avoid that? You become a longer term investor and you corner off a certain segment of your portfolio, which you'll trade and you'll play and you'll assume like you go to a casino, maybe I'll make some money, maybe I won't. I think I can beat the market. Fine. Try with a slice of your portfolio. That's fine. But not the heart of it, not everything. And yeah, you establish them some parameters and you don't go up against the short term traders. And that's one great thing that the individual still has the ability to invest longer term and the pros still aren't doing that. They talk a big game, but the other one's panicking and selling and buying on all the news, coronavirus and all that kind of stuff. So that's healthy. I also think that individuals have learned the lesson. You know, one thing I've learned from Wall Street is that everyone talks a big game. It's smart money. That's what I write about. I write about the so-called smart money. Well, the smart money has been investing in hedge funds for the past decade or so and has underperformed. And when we're talking about pension funds, we're talking about insurance companies, we're talking about endowments, well-paid people. And part of it, I think, is just the ecosystem. If you're an endowment or a pension fund, you are among others who invest in the same kind of things. You all pay money to consultants to give you advice. Do you think the consultant's going to come back and say, yeah, I think you should allocate the beginning of the year, don't touch it for the whole year, or go into index funds? They're not going to do that. So the smart money has been burned time and time again by being fast traders or investing in expensive products, hedge funds and such, whereas the individual investor sort of gets it. You know, it used to be, I'm older than you guys, I'm sure, but I remember like the late 90s, you go to like a barbecue or a bar mitzvah or something, everybody's got their like favorite stock, Cisco or Yahoo, etc. Today, it doesn't really happen. I mean, maybe Tesla or Bitcoin, but it's not as much because the average guy or woman realizes that you can't be this market. It's really an efficient market, especially if you're not a pro and don't even try to play to beat them. And we've allocated, you know, a 60-40. I've got a 60-40 Vanguard fund and it's after being burnt with active managers and my mutual funds. We can't really trade here and we've got all these different restrictions. But I think that the dumb money isn't so dumb anymore and the smart money isn't nearly as smart as we suggest it is. The data are pretty telling in that the so-called smart money that you described, like the hedge funds, well, at least based on current history, it is kind of dumb in that they're paying these crazy fees and they're not performing well. Why are they doing it? Why are the pension funds doing this? You kind of mentioned, but more specifically, it would be interesting to hear from you. I mean, to be fair, you could also argue that we've been in a unique environment where the Fed and monetary policy generally has been so free with money 
for years now that you could argue, they would argue it's an unusual environment. And eventually it will return to the norm, in which case the professional stock trader is going to do well. I would say there's something to be said for that, but it's more likely the fact that it's become just more efficient and it's just hard for the traditional, intuitive, smart, well-pedigreed trader type, hedge fund type to, to beat the market. So the market's just gotten harder to keep up with. So why do they keep doing it? It's still sexy to invest in a hedge fund. These people are the best and the brightest. They go to the best schools. They present really well. They present really well. A hedge fund guy's never wrong. He's always, you know, he was just a little too early maybe, or there's always some explanation. And you come away, trust me, I deal with these guys 24-7. You come away kind of believing what they have to say. And they're well-meaning. I don't mean to suggest in any way these are bad people. Good people are trying to make money for their clients. They just charge too much. If you're a professional on an endowment board, let's say, you're getting paid really well, a pension, you get pretty well. If you're a professional investor, you get paid to allocate. You're not going to come back to your board and say, okay, my conclusion after weeks of research is to put our money in a Vanguard 6040 fund. There's no way. You're not going to, they're going to be like, why are we paying you this salary? You're coming back to us with a 6040 fund. There's no way. You're going to justify your salary and you can't justify your salary by saying, hey, I'm going to be in a 6040 fund. On. Sorry, guys. That's always been Buffett's comment that if you pay consultants to tell you to invest in fancy stuff, they're going to tell you to invest in fancy stuff. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's a good point. Yeah, that's very true. I believe that. Can you share with us how you came to have such an interest in characters of Wall Street? And how do you get access to these people to tell such great stories? So I've always been fascinated by business in general. I remember being a kid and looking at the back of a Skippy container, a Skippy peanut butter. And I was like, wait, there's no Skippy corporation. It's owned by some like conglomerate, Procter & Gamble or whatever. And I was interested in how business come together and brands and products. And then I was fascinated by markets, the ups and downs and betting on companies. Listen, I'm a sports person. I'm big into home runs and strikeouts. And that's sort of what I do for a living. So I write about home runs and strikeouts on Wall Street. I do other things too. I do write analytical pieces. I break news and such. But a lot of what I do is sort of home runs and strikeouts. Some people have called it financial porn. You can be dismissive about it. But I think there are lessons to be learned from the successes and failures of individuals and companies. There's a lot of drama there too. And I don't know, life is short. So if I'm going to write about important topics, topics I think are important, business topics and such, I want it also to be fun. I'm a big believer in the whole Mary Poppins spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So I'm going to try to give you a fun read. So I'm going to try to get at important topics where the world is moving. I wrote a book about fracking and the environmental impact and the geopolitical impact. And I wrote about CDS contracts and the global financial meltdown in 2008. And I wrote a book, this current one is about how it's not just about investing in trading. It's also about how to manage employees, how to deal with this environment where we're politically split as a nation. And that's what happened at this firm renaissance where some people got really upset that one of their co-CEOs was the most important reason why Donald Trump's in office. So anyway, I try to get at important topics that are relevant to all of us through the people, through the characters, because I personally find characters, quirky individuals, fascinating. And not everyone does. And that's one of my advantages or differences with my colleagues. They do what they do really, really well. I happen to find characters. I like characters. You put me down like at a bar mitzvah or something next to some dentist. I don't know. I'm sure the dentist has a really fascinating story, challenges they overcame, which I personally, I'm selfish. In a lot of ways, I'm selfish because I want to learn life lessons. We've all had setbacks. We've all tried to overcome things or dealing with stuff right now, be it health, be it family, be it career and changing industries. How do you adjust? What do you do? How do you deal with setbacks? You know, there's a guy in my town who lost everything and had to rebound and has done so successfully. I think I'd have lost everything, but we've all had setbacks. I want to learn or maybe it's something I can teach my kids. So in a lot of ways, I'm just being really, really selfish and finding these characters because I want to hear their stories. But I'm a proxy for others and I think maybe readers do as well. And some people like my style, some people don't, but that's my approach, trying to get at important topics 
and learn lessons through interesting, quirky, colorful individuals. So I got to ask, I think you mentioned that you can't trade much, so you invest in a 60-40 Vanguard portfolio. Given the opportunity, knowing what you know about the Medallion Fund and Jim Simons and all the other characters in that story, given the opportunity, now the fund is closed and maybe you couldn't invest anyway because of your position with the Wall Street Journal, but given the opportunity, would you invest in the Medallion Fund today with a you know meaningful portion of your net worth? So I'm a jaded, cynical journalist who's been at the Wall Street Journal 23 years, and I've written about the rise and fall of individuals, companies, big names. So my DNA is to say, oh, these guys are going to collapse. But I don't think they will. I think they've got something special. And it's a combination of lots of all kinds of little things that I write about in my book. So yeah, if I had the chance, I'd invest in Medallion for sure. You know, could I be wrong? Definitely. Could they blow up tomorrow? For sure. Easily. I don't think they blow up. The returns could get worse. But not only would I invest in Medallion, they do have now outside funds They're available for institutions. They don't do as well. They don't do nearly as well. Reef is one of them. And I'm not in any way advocating in any way that people should go out and put money in Reef. And some people have been disappointed with Reef for the other funds. But yeah, all things being equal, I think they've done a really good job. So I, again, I come at this as a cynical, skeptical, more skeptical maybe than cynical, journalist. But I come away pretty impressed. And I do have to say, making in contrast earlier to John Paulson, I say at the end of my book, The Greatest Trade Ever, about John Paulson, that he's shifting into gold at that point. After that trade, it's a very different trade. I don't come out and say he's going to blow up or he's going to underperform, but I may be wrong. I have to look at it again. I think I leave the reader questioning whether he can keep it going, whereas I'm more optimistic when it comes to Renaissance, but I could be proved wrong. Interesting. And I guess the, it's a fascinating takeaway for the end investor, for the people listening, because with Reef, you can invest, but with Medallion, like the one that's really killed it, even if we said, yeah, I want in, you can't. <laughs> yeah. Even as friends and family can't. So it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Last question for you, Greg, is how do you define success in your life? It's a good question. Being happy, doing something that brings you fulfillment. I Me mean, personally, I like to have an impact to some extent, highlight things that are going wrong that maybe can save people. I've written some stories that hopefully have helped people. I wrote something about a company called care.com over the past year, a bunch of stories about this online site that wasn't properly vetting their caregivers and they've changed their operation as a result of our stories. Colleagues and I wrote these stories together. So I'm proud of that. I've written some stories, I think, that maybe shed light on some individuals have gone through some tough times and overcome some things. I wrote a couple of books with my two sons called Rising Above which are about sports stars who overcame challenges in their youth and how they did it. And we're hoping to inspire young people and teach them some lessons. Everybody's going through their own stuff. You'll hear that common theme, I guess, in things I've said today. But, you know, trying to leave this world a little bit better than where we got it. And it can be interpersonal. Everyone does it in their own way. And so successful teachers, successful doctors, you guys entertaining and informing, that's success in treating people well. I guess that's the way. I've never really thought about it, but that's the way I guess I would explain it or define it. It's a really good answer. And Greg, thanks for being willing to join us. And thanks for your book. We have recommended The Man Who Sold the Market in a prior podcast. So I know we've had many listeners read the book and we really do appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Sure. It was a lot of fun. These were some interesting questions that I hadn't thought about before. (laughs) Have a great day. That's great. Thanks a lot, Greg.